Hey, welcome again to Discovery Church. Let me just look in the camera and welcome everyone joining us online or whatever campus or even our outdoor courtyard. Wherever you are, make some noise if you're excited to be in God's house here in the Word today. Come on. Amen. We're in this series. We're actually in part two of a series we're calling Freedom. And I'm just believing, I'm declaring that this is going to be the year of freedom over your life, like this can be. You guys hear me. I hear my heart. I hope you believe it, that this can be the year of the greatest liberty and breakthrough that you've ever experienced. And I'm believing that it's going to start in this series as we lay a foundation of what freedom could look like in our life. And if you missed last week, you got to check that out. I went over two truths, uh, a few truths actually that were so foundational. I'm going to give you two of them today, because I really want to get them into your spirit. It's so important for you to get these, to grasp these, understand them, if you're going to be free indeed this year. They're not in your notes, and I got so much that isn't in your notes. Here it is. You're only as free as the truth you believe. This is the truth you need to understand, you guys. It's the truth that sets you free, but it's, it's not just, see, truth is like soap. It only works if you apply it. Do you know what I'm saying? You can have a truckload of soap, but if it don't touch your skin, it ain't working nothing. How many of you parents of teenagers know what I'm talking about right now, you know? You're like, you're, they're all wet, but you're like, but did you use the soap, okay? Did, you, did it touch the skin too much? Okay, here's the second truth. The second truth is this. When you believe the lie, you enthrone the liar. So there is a, a the, Jesus said that the liar, the enemy is the father of lies and how he works in our life, how he gets access to steal kill and destroy. He, he is producing a lot of havoc and chaos inside of our life. How does he do it? Through deception. It's when we believe his lies instead of the truth that actually can set us free. Last Sunday, we, uh, in our freedom declaration, I'll give it to you again today, but we had kind of like a survey that we gave and 48% of you said you recognized and identified that the area you need freedom in is in your habits. And this is a great time of the year, I think, to focus in on our habits. <clears throat> Maybe some ones that got out of order, some things that we stopped, some things that we started. And this is so important because some of you think you have problems. Listen to me. You don't have problems. You have patterns that cause problems. Okay? That, that's a, if you would just take a look into, if you would just probe into your patterns, it would prophesy your problems. So John chapter 8 um, I've given you a few scriptures. Let me give you a few more out of John chapter 8 to share with you where we're going today. Talk about habits. John chapter 8, verse 31. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So great job. You're abiding in it. You're going to know the truth. But then the people hearing him, the Jews that believed him said, they answered him, but we're Abra uh, the offspring of Abraham and we've never been enslaved to anyone. Now, this was a crazy thing for them to say because they are literally enslaved by Roman occupation at the time that they're saying this. And if you've read any of the Old Testament or know the history, they were enslaved by a lot of people throughout their history. And this would kind of be like our modern day translation of this would be like some of you are maybe here about freedom and slave, like being enslaved and needing to be set free. And you're like, I'm good, man. I've been a Christian for my whole life. I'm, I love God. I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. Or in the context of even what we're talking about today with habits, some of you hear this whole thing about habits and being free from habits, and you're like, I'm cool. I don't need something while you've been on like a, a three-day binger or something like that. That would be the context right here. In the middle of your addiction, they're in the middle of their occupation. They're going, ah, we're good. We don't need to be set free. And free. We haven't been enslaved. I'm not enslaved to this. It's not a problem. It's no big deal. How is it you could say you will be free? But Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Your patterns and your practices, listen to me, it's more spiritual than you realize. You think that you got it under control, but you're under occupation, dominated by Rome. Then it says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, say it with me out loud, you will be Free indeed. That's what we're going to go after in this series. And I don't want you to miss one installment. I wrote a book called Freedom. You can still get it outside. You can get it everywhere books are sold. But in this four-week series, I believe God has a fresh word for us. This is just different content that I believe God wants us to go on a different kind of journey of freedom to begin our year and, and make this the year of freedom. Last week, we talked about freedom from our past, 
how there's sometimes things in our past, the wounds and hurts and failures and setbacks that just stay with us. And how do we actually be free from those things so we're not carrying them around? That's what we talked about last week. But today, I want to talk to you about how do we get free from our destructive habits and how maybe can we develop some, what I'm calling freedom habits. How can we develop the habits that will actually uh, help us walk out freedom this year? And this this part of like free indeed is, is it's challenging because we all have this carnal nature. We have this flesh that does not really want to do the God things. It doesn't want to do the things that please God. It actually wants to do the things that please itself to satisfy our appetites and our desires. Second Peter chapter 2, 19 says it like this. They promise them freedom. Like we know it. The truth sets you free. I even know that this is a problem. It's like, it's a habit I probably shouldn't have while they themselves are slaves of destructive habits. It says, for we are slaves of anything that has conquered us. So how do we get rid of some of these bad habits that we have, some of the bad, destructive habits that are robbing us of our freedom? Because I don't think anyone actually plans to live this way. No one planned, like you didn't plan to live paycheck to paycheck and be in debt. You know, no one was like, when I grow up, I wanna live paycheck to paycheck. No one plans that. But there were patterns that prophesied that. If you were to look at 10 years ago, you how you were handling your first job, it could have prophesied how you're handling it right now. Are y'all with me today, okay? So, so we like, no one plans these things. We didn't plan to become overweight and to have poor health, but, but your, your patterns are proper. You didn't, no one plans to die young and not see their grandkids grow up, okay? No one plans to be addicted and to live their life out of control and lose their marriage or lose the respect of their kids. No one plans these things. The habits that you have today, though, will shape who you become tomorrow. Now, now this is, and every one of us deal with this, you guys. All, every, no one is immune to our carnal nature, to the flesh, to destructive habits and allowing the enemy to access our life through these things. In fact, the apostle Paul was, I love that the Bible is just so real, man. It doesn't like paint pictures of people that are just like so perfect you can't relate to. But the apostle Paul, who wrote two thirds of the New Testament, actually invited us into his kind of his carnal nature and his destructive habits. Look at it in Romans chapter seven with me. The apostle Paul says this, I don't really understand myself for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I, I do what I hate. I want to do what's right, but I can't. I feel like I can't. I want to do what's good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. Can anyone relate to the struggle that is very real here that the Apostle Paul is saying? He's, a, he's saying, look, there's things that I just, I feel like I conquer them at one moment and then they just come back. I don't want to do this stuff, but it keeps coming back. And then he goes, oh, what a miserable person I am. And all of us can sympathize with that when we thought we dealt with it. And then it comes back and we get to this place where we're like, dang it, man, I'm just, I'm just too jacked up. I'm just too, what a miserable. And then he says, who will free me? And maybe that's been a cry of your heart. If you've got there like, I'm never, who's gonna, how do I actually get free from this? I just don't get it. Who's gonna free me from this life dominated? Or Jesus said, enslaved, conquered by sin and death. And he goes, hey, but thank God, the answer is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So, so we're going to go on a journey of freedom from our habits. And, and, and I'm not, look, today in a 40-minute message, you're, I don't think that you're, all your habits are going to be gone after 40 minutes. But, but what I do believe is that today, if you're, you have faith to receive it, I believe it could be a catalyst and an impartation of a fresh power for you to walk out new freedom this year. I believe God can catalyze something, can impart something into you right here, right now that can carry you in to the rest of this year to walk out, to go on a journey of freedom because I've seen the other journey. As a pastor, I've seen people walk out their freedom and healing and be transformed. And year after year, they just look and look, it's like glory to glory and it's beautiful. But I've also seen the other journey of a journey of destruction and I've in fact, it's not in your notes because if you don't walk out this journey of freedom in your habits, there's another progression and another journey that takes place. Let me show you what it looks like. I've seen this over the years. I'm just trying to help you out because you might be in one of these stages, one of these progressions uh, uh, today because of your habits. And the first is this. The first is where that thing becomes part of your identity. Like that habit, like, like you, you start to claim it even. So you say things like, I can't change. 
I am this. I am a smoke. I am a smoker. I am an alcoholic. Alcoholic. I am. And you start to claim it as you. I am. I'm just an angry person. That's just who I am. Like you claim that person, like that personality, as if it was your identity. Listen to me. Your identity is not in your personality or anything. Your identity is in Christ. And the devil would love for you to believe that that is who you are, and you'll never be anything but that. But that is a lie from hell. But if we, don't, if we don't recognize that and it becomes part of our identity, this progression continues and you get to this place where you feel increasingly hopeless. And some of you came in here even today where you felt like, man, I don't know how I'm ever gonna conquer this. And, and there's this hopelessness that you feel. And, and again, this progression continues where you become, the third step of the stage is where you become defensive over the very things that are dominating you. Where someone will say, will say to you something like, you know, uh, hey, bro, you really shouldn't. And you're like, ah, come on. Why you got to bring that up? It was fine until you brought that up. And you defend these things and it's fine. It's normal. It's, it's, it's normal. Just because it's normal does not mean it's God's best for your life. And just because it's practiced as normal in society doesn't mean it's not destructive. You become defensive of the very thing that's dominating you that the enemy is using to steal, kill, and destroy. And eventually you come to this stage where you become a slave to it. This is what Jesus talked about, where that thing now is cracking the whip on you. It's telling you how to live and privately, secretly, anyone who gets to this stage, you still know, like in your heart, you even tell yourself, I don't have to live this way. I wasn't made for this. There's gotta be more to this, but you just feel like you can't crack out of it. Like it's, you are dominated by that thing, you can't, you can't, you feel like at least, you can't stop. And then you get to this ultimate stage of this journey of that habit, controlling and dominating you where you just begin to lose your life. So you're going to heaven, you know, sure, you're going to heaven possibly, but you're just not walking in the victory, authority, and freedom that God intended you to here on earth. So maybe you're going to heaven, but you lose your marriage. You may, be, yeah, you may love God and you have faith and by faith you're, but, but you're not living the purpose and the destiny that God has called you and appointed you to. The enemy came in and there was a crack in that door through your habits that he got access to steal and to kill and to destroy. Well, listen, I want to reverse this curse. I want to reverse this progression that some of you may be on at any of those stages and change the progression, get you going on a journey of healing and transformation and by the truth that sets you free. Can I get an amen, somebody? So how do we do it? How do we, how do we get rid of, let me start, and I'm going to give you some freedom habits, but how do we get rid of the bad habits that maybe are giving the enemy access into our life? Number one, write it down. We got to acknowledge it. You just got to acknowledge it and repent so you got to acknowledge it. That's first, man, because you cannot defeat what you cannot define. Let me say that again. You cannot defeat what you cannot define. So maybe we don't recognize the destructive habit because it's so normalized in our life. We've normalized it, but it's robbing us of our freedom. And maybe it's, it's, it's an area that maybe you wouldn't even think, like, it, like you just said, ah, oh, no, it's fine. It's normal. It's not a big deal. Maybe it's attitudinal. Maybe your destructive habit is actually an attitudinal habit. Maybe, it's, maybe you, have a, you have a critical spirit. You like to say you're a realist, but really you're just a negative person who doesn't walk by faith. Was that too hard for you? I'm sorry. Okay, so may, maybe, maybe you're, you're, you're a complaining person. Maybe you are a gossip, and, and there is a destructive habit that you have. It's attitudinal that, that if you let this destructive habit continue, it's going to destroy your relationships. It's going to destroy your purpose. You, maybe it's overeating. Maybe you can't walk by the sweets. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it's the ice cream. Maybe it's fast food and snacks, and maybe there are things that are dominating you that if you don't get a hold of it now, then, then it's going to come back later, Okay. We, that, are, that are just dominating us. Maybe it's technology. But every one of us are probably addicted to technology. Okay, because it was fun at first, but now it's ruining your relationships. Now, it's, now it's, it's hurting, okay? So many people, it's so accessible, technology. And here's the problem with this, with uh, the, the way that we're dealing with technology right now. Because every, humans, we have this need to please people. We want, but it used to be years ago, decades ago, we used to just want to please the people in front of us, the people that matter, the people that were in our life, that we were doing life with. But now we want to please the 16 million people that we don't even know. 
And this is so destructive. This is so unhealthy for our mental, emotional, and spiritual health. We have maybe some habits for, with, with technology or video games or you're binge watching or you're, or you're looking at porn through it or, or you're, you're, maybe it is just the mobile device itself. It's the phone. You cannot go without it and checking it and checking it. Or maybe it is a substance. Maybe it's a substance that you've normalized, like sugar or caffeine. Or maybe it's that prescription that you should have stopped years ago. Or maybe it's that alcohol that you said isn't a problem. But if more than one person's telling you it's a problem, it's probably a problem. James 1.21, so get rid of every filthy habit and all wicked conduct. See, the problem is you're like, well, oh, Master, that's the problem. I got like 27 of them. All of them you listed right now are my problem. <laughs> what am I going to do here? Can I tell you? Just focus on one at a time. That's it. Give God just one, just one at a time, and you got this. Submit to God and accept the word. Don't get defensive. Don't defend it. Don't, don't reject it. Don't check out on me. Don't toot out on me right now because you don't want to hear it. Accept the word because it has the power to save you is what it says. The truth will set you free. This word has a power to save you. You acknowledge it. Hey, this is a problem. I'm going to stop acting like it. it isn't. And I don't have to live this way. I don't want to live this way. You acknowledge it and you repent. Now listen, remorse is not repentance. Just because you feel sorry, remorse is when you feel bad, but you didn't change the pattern, okay? Repent is where you change the direction. You change it, okay? So how do you then change the pattern? Because I acknowledge it and I repent, but how do I change the pattern? Write it down like this. The second thing is you gotta remove the trigger. That's how you change the pattern. You remove the trigger. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, you should read it if you're really serious about this. You want to get some more tools. But he shares five primary ways that habits in our life get triggered. And if you understand what's triggering those bad habits, then you can actually remove those triggers and cut off the habit from happening. So what are the five? Not in your notes. I'm going to give you a lot of extra notes today, okay? Number one, the big trigger is time. There are certain times of the day that habits are triggered. For instance, the big one is morning. In the mor your morning routine is a habit. You do things habitually in the morning the same way in the morning. And some of those things are good. Like you brush your teeth at the same time the same way. Praise God. I hope you have that habit. You have certain, and then, but some of them are bad. So, some of you have the habit of the first thing you, you do when you wake up is you grab your phone and you scroll on social media before you get up. So there's certain times that, because that, on that time, because you don't look at porn in your small group, you look at porn when you're bored and at home late at night, that time. That's the time where you need to be mindful of that, okay? That's the first trigger. The second trigger is the place. There are certain places that actually are triggers for you for habits, and you need to identify what those places are because you don't overeat at the gym. That's not where you're overeating. That's not that place, Okay? You don't, you don't get high at church. I hope not. A good, a good example of this was David and Bathsheba. Remember, the Bible says in a time when kings go off to war, David was in the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's something triggered, didn't it? Okay. So, so you got to be careful of the time, the place. Number three is your mood. You are more vulnerable to certain things some of these destructive habits, when you are in certain moods, the habits are, it's actually an acronym. It's HALT, H-A-L-T. It's whenever you are hungry, you are angry, lonely, or tired, HALT. You ain't in a good place. You better get out of that place. Don't make decisions. Don't, you get, protect yourself when you are hangry. How many know hangry, right? Hangry, hungry, angry, lo lonely, or tired. You gotta, you gotta get yourself out of danger. You're in the wrong mood. That's gonna trigger a destructive habit. Number four is the moment moment, meaning you do the same thing after that moment happens. Like, so you have a bad day at work, really stressful. Boss comes down at you or something. You go to the same drugstore and get your brand of liquor because that's, you just do the same thing. It's your, it's, it's what you do. Or after your fight with your husband, you call your girlfriends and have a man bashing party. <laughs> it's a trigger. It's just triggering it, right? Okay. Or after the softball game with the guys, you go get drinks. You, get, you just got to know the triggers, man. There are certain moments that happen that trigger the habit that you need to realize and cut those triggers off. You got to remove the triggers. And the fifth one, the last one is people. There are certain people 
in your life that trigger your destructive habits. If you've got the wrong people, you're going to go in the wrong direction. The, the study on this is so conclusive. The closer you are to someone, you are, the, the more likely you are to imitate their habits. Okay? It's almost impossible to live the right kind of life when you have the wrong kind of friends. Proverbs 4 says it like this. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. He says, avoid it. Don't even go near them. Don't travel on it. Turn from it. Go a different direction. Remove the trigger from your life. If you want to remove the habit, remove the trigger. Break the pattern. But then you don't stop there. This is why many of our, our what is it, our New Year's resolutions and maybe even our habits that we've tried to fix and we tried to get rid of and it works for a while and it doesn't, because you stopped here at removing the triggers and removing the habits. Don't stop there. You got to do this third thing, which is replacing the space. You got to replace the space. Because what happens when you remove the move, the time, the place, the people, all these things, it creates a void in your life and in that space. It's called a vacuum effect. It's going to want to be filled by something else. And if you do not fill it with the right thing, if you don't fill the space, then you, that thing will come back knocking on your door. Or maybe even something worse can come back in. In fact, Jesus actually talked about this in Luke chapter 11. It says, he said, when an evil spirit leaves a person, let me time out right there. I am not saying that your habit is an evil spirit. You don't need to cast out the demon of cigarettes. You need to be a man and stop smoking already, okay? You need to, you need, okay. But here's what you need to realize is that habit is creating the avenue and open door. That destructive habit is creating the open door for spirits to access your life. That's what you need to realize, though, in all this. So Jesus is saying that, he says, he says when an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert searching for rest, but it doesn't find none. So it says, I'll return to the person, because that's what de demons want a body to inhabit. So they'll go search for the person I came from. So it returns and finds that its former home is all swept and in order. Then the spirit finds seven other spirits more evil than itself. And they all enter the person and live there. And so the person is worse off than before. What is Jesus describing here? He's not saying this is just how it has to be. What he's saying is this phenomena that happens when you remove the habits and you get your life clean and clear, but all it is is in order you didn't fill the space. You didn't fill the space with, with God's word or the Holy Spirit, and you didn't fill with some freedom habits I'm about to give you. So, so when they do try to come back, the, the space is full. It's occupied. They can't enter here. Okay. Here's, let me say it like this. Bad habits, they're really easy to develop, but they're hard to live with. And the opposite of that is true. Good habits are hard to develop, but they're easy to live with. And this is why when we got rid of the bad habit, we didn't fill the space and replace it because it's really hard to develop that good habit, isn't it? Like good habits, they're hard to develop, but easy to live with. Like getting up in the morning and working out or going on a run when it's cold. That's hard to develop, but it's easy to live with because nine months later, you've lost some weight. You got to buy new pants and you look good. And you feel good. And you're thinking good, okay? Going to church, man. I got, hey, what, make a habit. I'm gonna go to church, but, but it's easy to not, right? You're gonna go, but what happens if you do, if you make that happen to come to the house of God, worship God, hear God's word? Well, sometime like your marriage is actually gonna be better. You're gonna have peace of mind and peace in your heart because good habits are hard to develop, but they're easy to live with. Bad habits, on the other hand, they're easy to develop and hard to live with because you can, you can relieve your stress by smoking. You could, you, could, you could smoke weed, you could vape, you could do whatever. It, it'll relieve your stress in the short term, but in the long term, decades later, until you get diagnosed with cancer or lung disease, okay? So it's, it's easy to develop, but it's hard to, to live with, okay? You can relieve your stress by eating food and continue to do that. You can, you can pile on the plate and it'll feel good in the short term until you get diagnosed with di diabetes or lose a foot. It's a hard topic today, ain't it? But I want you free, you guys. I want to see you free indeed. And if we are going to be free, then we have to remove some of these destructive habits from our life and not just remove them and cut the triggers off. We got to replace the space with what I'm calling today freedom 
habits. I got seven freedom habits that this year I would love for you to. Now, this list began with 15 and I shortened it to seven, so you're welcome. So you're going to be like, oh, seven habits, man, that's a lot. There's like, I could put so many, there's just so many things, but, but if you could just seven freedom habits, I think that this could be a year of freedom for you in Jesus' name. What are they? Some new habits we're going to develop. Number one, what if we chose this habit to choose forgiveness? What if this year we said, I know people are going to hurt me. They're going to they're going to disappoint me. <laughs> They're going to let me down. I'm going to experience those things. And I choose, pre-decided here, I'm going to forgive them. I'm not going to be someone who's going to hold the grudge, hold offense, get all bitter about it. I'm not going to do that, man. The reality is, remember, you don't have a problem. You have a pattern that causes problems. Some of you have a pattern of holding grudges. You have a pattern of getting offended. Every time someone does something wrong, it gets you all discombobulated. What if you broke that pattern? And you actually to create a new pattern where you forgave a lot easier and quicker. I think you'd walk out some freedom. See, unforgiveness is a bondage of your own making. Ephesians chapter 4, 27 says it like this. And do not give the devil an opportunity. One translation says a foothold. We're giving him a place to access our life, to steal, kill, and destroy. How? By leading you into sin, by holding that grudge. By nurturing anger, harboring resentment, and cultivating bitterness. Look, it's going to happen. This year, you're going to get hurt. So you're going to have to ha create a habit that, because a lot of people are bound by these pains and hurts and disappointments. I promise you this year, it's going to happen. You know why? Because people are stupid. <laughs> so I am too. You are too. People are, can be mean. They can have bad days. It's going to happen. And so you're going to need a new habit, man, in order to not let other people dictate your freedom. Forgiveness does not excuse their behavior. It just prevents their behavior from destroying your heart. And you don't forgive because people deserve it. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. You forgive to set yourself free. So here's a new freedom habit for you this year. I'm not going to get caught by the enemy's lies no more. I'm not going to give him a foothold and an opportunity in my life by making me offended and holding a grudge. I'm going to pre-decide this thing. I got a new habit. I forgive easy. I'm going to choose to forgive, okay? Number one. Number two, I'm going to choose to be a peacemaker, I'm going to choose to be, I'm going to make peace, man. This, this is a relational, another relational one, because a lot of people are bound because of the relational trials and challenges in their lives. So, man, this year, I'm going to be a peacemaker. Notice though I said peacemaker and not peacekeeper. There's a big difference between peacemakers and peacekeepers. Peacemakers, they confront the problems. They confront the people. They confront the, the conflict to actually make peace. Peacekeepers avoid the problem. They avoid the people. They compromise to create pseudo peace, false sense of peace. Okay, Matthew chapter five, verse nine, Jesus said, bless, here's the translation of that bless, spiritually calm with life, enjoying God's favor. How many of you want that blessed life? You want a spiritually calm in life, enjoying God's favor. Blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace for they will express his character and be called the sons of God. That's who we are. This year, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shy away from the hard work. Listen, peace is hard work. It's gonna be hard work for you to be a peacemaker, okay? To not to choose not to gossip, to choose not to run, to choose to step into that conflict and actually reconcile instead of um, seek retribution. I'm gonna be a peacemaker. It's hard work, but it's worth it. And peacemakers will be called sons of God. Third habit. I know this, is, this one might be new to some of you, but it's so important. I will Sabbath weekly. Here, I'm going to make a new habit in my life. I'm going to have this thing called Sabbath in my life. I'm going to take a day of rest. It's amazing how many people would never think about murder or theft, which is in the Ten Commandments, but we disobey the Sabbath, which is the Fourth Commandment. Honor the Lord on Sabbath. It is holy unto the Lord. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. What would it look like if this year you didn't just, what would it look like if you, if you made a commitment? I'm going to be found in the house of God. I am going to be at church as much as possible. If I'm not here, I'll watch it online. If I'm out of town, I'm going to be in the house of God. And then you don't just come to church for like a service, but you give God a day. What, if you, what would your life look like if you actually honored the Lord's Sabbath? Like take a day. Here's trusting God. Obeying God is easy when you trust God. 
Some of us are not obeying this, this idea of rest because we don't think it works. Because I'm built different, and I got a lot to do, and I can handle it. Listen to me. If God rested, you should rest. Look at Genesis chapter 2. The commandment comes from Genesis chapter 2. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he'd done, and he rested on the seventh day. The Bible says he sanctified it, made it holy. He did it as an example for you. You were designed by God, created by God, to have a day of rest in your seven-day rhythm. You were designed. And you're like, no, nah, but I just, I, I'm, I'm strong. I got it. God rested, though. But I'm like, my personality is, and there's a lot to do. Listen to me. God rested, though. Like, he rested. If he rested, you should rest. He created a model for us to actually stop. Here's the four things. The four things that a Sabbath consists of. Four things. Stop. Like, stop. <laughs> stop it. Stop working. Stop chores. Stop producing. Just stop producing and rest. Take it easy. Enjoy and worship. Those four things are, are what consists of a Sabbath. Stop, rest, enjoy. Where, like enjoy. Enjoy the day. Enjoy the people around you. Just like have those conversations. Enjoy some good food. Enjoy it. Taste it. Don't just like scarf it down and get back to work. Enjoy that meal. You know what I mean? Enjoy the outdoors maybe. Enjoy the sky. Enjoy the birds chirping. Enjoy the sound of the wind in the trees. And just enjoy life for a moment and pause for 24 hours. Rest for the day and worship God. Your life would be so much better. And here's why it's actually a habit you need. Because some of you, your habits, the trigger for your bad habits is because you're going too fast and too hard. You are not designed to go that fast and go that hard. Even if you feel like you're built different, listen to me, you're not. You're not. God designed you and he knows better. And you eventually will get to the end of yourself and you only have so much willpower and strength and you'll come to a place where that habit comes knocking on your door and you're worn down and you're weak because you're not operating by God's word and his standard. And eventually you're gonna open the door to not only that thing, but seven others worse than itself. If, you, if, if you're not rested and strong, and listen to me, I promise you this, God can actually do more through you and in you with six days and, a, and hit, honoring a day of rest than you can with control of your life doing it all yourself. Your business will be better. Listen to me for anyone who's struggling that with your business. I get it. I get it. I started Discovery Church uh, 10 years ago, and it's been a grind, okay? But I, can, I promise you this. When I, honored, when I changed my rhythm and honored a Sabbath, my Sabbath is all Monday, and I honored the Sabbath, I saw greater outpouring grace, favor, and miracles in my life and on this ministry than I've ever seen with me doing it seven days a week. I tried, and I got to the end of myself, okay? So I don't know what your day is going to be, but choose, make a habit that you sharpen your saw. You take, you take the time to Sabbath every week. Have church be part of it, but then rest, Stop, rest, enjoy, worship. Number four, here's another habit. I will pray daily. Like I know we should pray without ceasing and, and, and like uh, walk in the spirit and pray at all times. Yes, absolutely. I get that. But can I get, just get you to pray daily? You know what I'm saying? Can I just get you to like pray every day? And some of us, we begin 21 days of prayer and fasting, but you like, you still aren't praying. You don't have a, a habit of prayer. Do you know what fasting is without praying? It's a diet. You started a diet, and I'm not saying you don't need a diet, but I'm saying that's not what we're doing, okay? I think there are a lot of people who want to pray, though. You want to pray. It's just you don't know what to do. When I, when I talk to people in my years of ministry, talking to people, discipling people, people want to pray, but we just don't know how. Like, what do I do in that space? It might be a little bit awkward where Jesus taught us how to pray. In Matthew chapter, let me kind of break down the Lord's Prayer. He teaches us in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 13, Jesus says, pray like this. And before I give you what this is, I know it's going to help you because it's God's word, but the heart of prayer, please hear me, is not necessarily to seek God as much as it is to be with God. Very important to understand here because you're not trying to achieve his presence as much as you are trying to recognize his presence. You're not calling down the presence of God. You're acknowledging he is there. 
This is what prayer essentially is. It, some of you here, you think you got to go, when you go into your prayer time, you're like, oh, I got to get God back in my life. So you go to prayer and you're like, you're trying really hard to get God back. God, oh, get, get, I need you. And I need, that's not what prayer is. Prayer is acknowledging his presence. It's being aware he is actually with me now. And as you do this daily, then you will be able to become more aware and acknowledge him more. Then you'll be able to walk in the spirit and pray without ceasing. But you can't walk in the spirit or pray without ceasing if you don't actually just pray daily and get a discipline of acknowledging he's already there. You get this, you guys get it? So we're not seeking him, we're being aware of him. And then he gives us seven steps and I gotta do it quickly. I told you I got a lot of notes for you. Seven steps. The first one, Jesus says, if you wanna learn how to pray, pray like this, praise. That's the first step for your prayer life. Start your prayer off, not with your requests, not with your petitions. Jesus said you should start praising. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. Hallowed be your name. He says, this is the first thing. Worship God. Give him praise. Approach him as a father. It's relational. But then make his name holy. We did a whole series on the names of God. You can actually begin your prayers just calling out the names of God and worshiping his name. Holy is your name, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. You're my peace, God. You thank you, God, and you're just praising God. That's how your prayer. Jesus said, start like this. Start with praise and then purpose. Here's your purpose. Your kingdom come, your will be done, God. I'm not gonna give you, I'm still not giving you my will. I'm not asking for my stuff. Right now, God, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is where, hey, may your will be accomplished on earth, God. In this nation, may your will be accomplished. And in, in my job and in my bosses, in my family, in my personal life, may your will be accomplished. And God is just through, if you practice this, I'm telling you, your prayers and your requests begin to change when you start with praise and, and, and purpose. It'll change the way you pray. The third is provision. Now you're gonna start making personal petition. Give us today the food we need or our daily bread. Notice Jesus said to say, give us though. Very important because we got to acknowledge all of it comes from God. It's yours, God. Give us today our daily bread. We're in a very dangerous place in America because many of us don't believe we need God for our daily bread anymore. We're well fed and we got leftovers, but the reality is everything comes from God. And when I pray and I come into prayer and I start making requests, I acknowledge that God, you are the provider of my daily needs. You're the provider of my breath, of my strength. It all comes from you. So I'm going to ask for help. And, and even the things I think I can control in the meeting that's coming up, in the bills that need to be paid, in, in, in my conversation I need to have with my son, God, just you, give us today our daily bread. And then number four, he says, pray for purity. Forgive us, God. And you spend some time there. Search me, oh Lord, know my heart. And as you spend some time right there, just say, God, search me, forgive me. God will bring some things. He'll, he'll show you what you said that you shouldn't have said. He'll show you your doubt, your disobedience. He'll show you your pride. He'll show you your lust. And he'll show you, man, I'm really not as, as clean and good and righteous as I thought. Forgive me, God. And then now you, you can move to, and I'm going to forgive them too. And it's a lot easier to forgive them too once you know what you've been forgiven. And the reason why some of you hold your grudges and offenses and it's hard for you to forgive them is because you don't have a time of repentance asking the Holy Spirit to reveal how sinful that you actually are and how much you need grace and mercy operating in your life. Amen, somebody? Okay, the next step, Jesus said, pray for power. Power. Don't lead us and don't let us yield to temptation. So you put on the armor of God. God, give me power. Six, give me protection. Rescue us from the evil one. Help me to recognize that there is an enemy, to be aware of his schemes. He is prowling, seeking someone to devour. And then number seven, you end with his priorities. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. If you pray this, this way, just, just spend some time, like make it a habit. These seven things, make it a habit every day to pray through this I promise you, man, this is a freedom habit that can actually set you free and change your life. If you do this every day, go through this process. If, if you had the habit of prayer, I'm telling you, you'd have a lot less anxiety and a lot more peace in your life. Number five, the fifth freedom habit. I will be accountable to my community. I'm actually gonna develop some authentic community. I'm gonna get with some brothers, some sisters. I'm not gonna just try to, you know, 
maintain acquaintances and get to know people's first names. No, I'm going to be real. I'm going to actually be accountable with some of these habits that I've been dealing with and I want to conquer and I'm tired of them conquering me. I'm going to let some people know I'm going to be accountable to my community. Your friends determine the direction of your life. You got to get the right people in your life. Hebrews chapter 10 says it like this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some have actually developed the destructive habit of doing but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the return of Christ is coming near, we should do it even more, he says. Today is small group Sunday. We have 161 small groups for you to choose from, meaning this, there is one that's right for you, okay? There's one that fits your time, your day, your schedule, your interests. We actually have this book that I wrote, Freedom, is a small group. There is, I believe, eight to 10 groups, men's and women's groups, that will be studying and walking through the eight steps of healing and transformation. I would love for a bunch of you to get connected to the freedom group. Freedom is an actual category though. We have like other types of freedom groups, like we have anxiety and depression groups that some of you may need to finally conquer this and be free in Jesus' name. We have a, a group called, another freedom group called Conquer. It's a Conquer series group. It's about lust and some of you need to be free in Jesus' name. This year it's going to be broken in Jesus' name and get connected to that. Celebrate recovery for all of our addictions and habits. Some of you need to jump in there, man, and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm tired of acting like this isn't a problem. I'm going to be free in Jesus' name. We got men's and couples and women. We got all kinds of groups. Find one that is right for you. This is a freedom habit. I'm going to be accountable. I'm going to let people in and let people know what's, what, I, what I'm dealing with, the habits I'm breaking in my community. Number six, I will test every spirit. I got to go quick because I'm running out of time. I'm glad I didn't do 15. Number six, I will test every spirit. See, not, not all revelation comes from God. And, and not even all of what, what appears to be spiritual comes from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, take heed that no one deceives you. There's a lot of deception happening in the world today. First John chapter four says, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. See, it's a lot more spiritual than you think. You think it's just a habit. You think it's just a pattern. No, there's a spirit behind that thing that's actually stealing, killing, and destroying your life. There's an open door and a foothold that's happening. You got to learn how to test those spirits. It's, man, here just recently, too, we got we to learn how to discern, church, discern what's coming at us and, and what's behind, what's the spirit behind those things. I had someone recently come up to me and explain, well, they were holding the Bible, they were telling me why they believed in reincarnation. I'm like, wow, this, this is, no, no, this is the truth. The Word of God is the truth that will set you free. So if you really want to be able to discern and test the spirit, you want to be free, you got to do the seventh one, this last one. You got to know the truth that sets you free. What if this would be the year for you to say, I'm going to make it a habit. I will know the truth. I'm not going to be reliant and dependent upon somebody preaching and teaching me truth. I am going to know the truth myself. This is the truth that sets me free. I'm going to study it. I'm going to know it. You know, that Jesus said, you'll truly be my disciple if you abide in my word. You know that word disciple comes from the word discipline. It's going to take some new disciplines for you to walk out the year of freedom, for you to get rid of some destructive habits, for you to start some freedom habits and walk out your freedom and go on a journey of freedom instead of this other progression that we've been going on. It's going to take some new disciplines, some new patterns, some new habits. Second Timothy, not in your notes, but in 2 Timothy 2.15, he says, he says, work hard to show yourself approved. Someone who rightly handles the word of truth. It takes hard work. It's going to take some hard work. The author of Hebrews was kind of, he was, he was talking to the church who at this time, because they've been following God for a while, they should have been mature and leading and should have been, you know, moving on to some greater things that God had for them. And they weren't. They were still, they were still small. They were still doing small things. He says in Hebrews chapter 5, he said, for indeed, although being obligated, you should be teachers by now because of the time, you again have need that someone teaches you the elementary things in the beginning concerning the oracles of God. And you have become ones having need of milk and not solid food. For everyone who's partaking milk is inexperienced in the word of righteousness. For he's still an infant. He's saying, you guys are still acting like babies, although it's been so long. You become needing milk and not solid for everyone partaking of milk. He says an infant, but solid food is for the mature. The ones because of habit, having their faculties trained for discernment of both good and evil. 
What if this year we actually trained the faculties? Like we created a habit of the Word of God that trained our faculties to discern good and evil in our life, to see what's coming out, to have, to have discernment of the Spirit behind some of the things and some of the people in our, in our life, around our life, and the things that we're, we're watching. Uh, you know what? This, in order for you to be free, you got to know the truth that sets you free. I could have gave you more. I gave you seven. Here's, here's this. Everyone take out this connection card inside of your bulletin. Do me a favor. Pull this out because some of you are here today, and I want to invite you on this freedom journey, a, a journey that, that maybe it, it's just for this series, for the four weeks in this series. Maybe, can I challenge you, for the rest of this year to make it uh, the, the year of freedom, that you get free of some things. And Jesus, and you become free. And if that's you, and you're like, no, I want to be free of some of this stuff, Pastor. I, I'd love to. There's a declaration that I'd like for you to make with me. On this back of the connection card, it says freedom. There's a declaration of freedom that we're making together. If that's you, and you say, yeah, I want to go on the freedom journey. I got a freedom keychain that's at every exit. All of our greeters and ushers have it. I want you to have it. Put it on you. Be reminded of what God wants to do, that this is the year you're going to be free in Jesus' name. Make sure you give them their connection card. They'll give you a freedom keychain if you're going on this journey. Here's the declaration of the journey. I commit to wholeheartedly embracing the liberating truths of God's word, dispelling every deceptive chain that seeks to bind me with unwavering determination. I affirm that freedom is not just a possibility, but a reality within my grasp. I declare with confidence and conviction, I can be free. I will be free. And I will actively walk in the glorious freedom that awaits me. If you want to go on this journey, that journey of freedom, then that's your declaration. I'd love for you to fill out the card and then find out what letter is right. There's like five letters. There's, there's a freedom journey that looks unique for you. Maybe some of you need to check off the A. And you need, like what we're talking about today, hey, that's like freedom from my habits. What you're talking about today, Pastor, I need freedom there, right there. I need to be free of some stuff. I need to break some, start some. Check off A if that's you. By the way, what you check off will determine some resources and things. Throughout this series, I'm going to shoot you some resources, depending on what you checked off, so that you can actually walk out freedom this year, okay? B is for those of you that say, in my inheritance, like the ancestors and my parents passed on some things to me that I'm now walking out and modeling. I need to be free and break this in the name of Jesus. You, you mark B. C is those of you that say, I need freedom from my past. We talked about this last Sunday, but if you're here and you're like, there are some wounds and pains and stuff I'm still carrying around I need to be set free from. It's still affecting me today. Check off C. D is in our thoughts. 74% of you said that you need freedom in this area. And I'm going to help you out with these in this series and throughout this year to be free in the battlefield of our mind. E are those of you that say, Pastor, I'm good. I'm totally free. I'm not bound by nothing. 0.01% of you said that. So there are 12 of you, actually, that I, have, I haven't yet called you, but I'm about to, I'm going to call you, okay? I am going to call you. I'm, I'm still, there was thousands of these cards, you know, but I am going to call you because I, I need to learn some stuff, okay? So here's, the, let, me, let me give you one last thing before we pray. Real and lasting change isn't behavior modification. It's spiritual transformation. So important, like, oh, let me just, behavior modification, let me change my habits and patterns and then I'll, I'll truly be, no, 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 that's not the real change that God desires. Quite possibly, that's the reason why you have not been free yet is because you're doing it yourself. You're trying to modify your behavior when that's not what Christianity is. That's not what faith is. God actually wants to give you a brand new heart. He wants to give you new desires, new thoughts. He wants to work inside of you from the inside out, change your life, not from the outside in. Real change, lasting change. It's not behavioral modification. It's spiritual transformation. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.